Hey guys, uh, this is a quick video about secondary hyperparathyroidism. It's something that I researched a bit back when I was studying for step one to get some clarification on. It was just one of those things that is kind of easy to understand on the surface maybe, but there's a couple subtleties that are worth knowing. So first off, three high yield points. First, secondary hyperparathyroidism is defined as elevated PTH, which is due to either low calcium or high phosphate. So it's not just hypocalcemia that can cause it. Some people forget about the phosphate being high as another stimulus. Uh, second, the buzzword for any hyperparathyroidism, and that's not just secondary hyperparathyroidism, and the question stem is subperiosteal absorption. So high PTH, subperiosteal absorption. They might also say subperiosteal cysts, subperiosteal cavities, something like that, but just like kind of get that in your head. It's a description of osseitis fibrosis cystica. It occurs because PTH grabs calcium from the bone, leaves those cysts behind. It's important to recognize because they might describe it and ask you to give the lab results after that. Uh, third, the body typically does not overcompensate. It's important for a lot of things in medicine. It's important understanding acid-base arrangements, and it's really critical here. So if we have low calcium or high phosphate, the abnormalities are going to cause PTH to try and fix them, and PTH will make them less deranged, but PTH isn't going to go the other way. PTH isn't going to overcorrect a hypocalcemia into hypercalcemia. So just kind of remember that if you have a patient and all they have wrong with them is hypocalcemia, say. They just have low calcium, so PTH comes in, tries to rescue it. Well, you know that they're still going to have low calcium after PTH is compensated. So you can be in a compensated state and still have that primary abnormality just because it wasn't completely fixed. All right. So let's take a look at this table. I'm pretty sure I got all the possible calcium phosphate arrangements worth discussing here, so we'll walk through them. And of course, all of these are going to have elevated PTH in the first column because that's obviously what we're discussing. So first off, renal failure. Uh, the most common one, um, some people actually think that this is the only cause of hyper hyperparathyroidism, but that's not true. Um, the primary abnormality is an inability to convert 25-hydroxyvitamin D to 125-hydroxyvitamin D. And just remember, 1-alpha uh, hydroxylase is found in the cells of the PCT, a little high-yield point. Uh, so in renal failure, this lack of vitamin D is going to decrease both calcium and phosphate levels since vitamin D absorbs the, uh, both calcium and phosphate from the kidneys and the GI tract. Uh, but a key point to understand here is that there's a second arrangement. The kidneys can't d excrete phosphate anymore, and so the body retains the phosphate. And that's in addition to low vitamin D uh, decreasing both calcium and phosphate. So there's two separate things here, and some people kind of have a hard time understanding that. Uh, so PTH tries to bring the calcium back up, but it's not back, quite back up to normal yet, and the net result is the set of labs you see. So second, we have an isolated deficiency of vitamin D. This could be dietary, maybe lack of sun exposure, maybe in someone with steatorrhea, and just as a little exercise, uh, we'll go through some key patient populations in which maybe they'll try and frame the question and then ask you for the lab values. So what would be the etiology in a neonate? Well, maybe they weren't supplemented with vitamin D because it's not in the breast milk. Remember that you have to supplement vitamin D, just like you have to supplement vitamin K because neonates have no gut flora. What about in an infant? Well, maybe they have cystic fibrosis. Maybe they have A beta lipoproteinemia. Either one of those could cause low uh, fat soluble vitamins. What about in an adult? Well, maybe they're on Orlistat trying to lose weight. It's a lipase inhibitor. And maybe they are on cholestyramine, or bile acid resin, trying to lower their cholesterol. So just a couple causes there. Whatever the cause, uh, we have low calcium and phosphate causing increased PTH. PTH trying to bring that calcium back up, but it isn't fully successful. So next we have hypocalcemia. It's kind of a theoretical option because I don't, I mean, I don't remember ever being tested on calcium back when I was taking step one. Just calcium alone, but it's a valid possibility. Uh, you know, maybe this could be like a drug side effect from a loop diuretic. Uh, Foscarnet can do this. Um, amphotericin can derange a couple ions. Maybe calcium would be one of them. 
Um, so low calcium will cause the body to increase PTH and 1-alpha hydroxylase levels. So PTH will be increased, 1,25-hydroxy vitamin D will be increased, and because of high PTH, phosphate will be wasted. And then another kind of theoretical one, hyperphosphatemia. There's like a few causes of this. They're not really important for step one. I mean, you'll see it like maybe increased dietary intake does happen. And compromised renal function is a big cause, but, you know, that wouldn't be isolated hyperphosphatemia. But either way, just theoretically, high phosphate is going to increase PTH, which would raise calcium as a side effect. And then that combination of high calcium and high phosphate makes the body realize vitamin D isn't needed, so 1,5-hydroxylase activity will decrease. So that's really all there is to calcium phosphate endocrine interactions, etc. So uh, I hope that helped. Thanks for watching, guys.